Welcome to the seventh annual summit. And the uh, presenter here, Steve McMillan, um, from the Apollo Education Group. He's director of Enterprise Knowledge Management for University of Phoenix. Um, responsible for standardized knowledge management methodology and support technologies at the University of Phoenix. Prior roles, director of IT service desk and lead director of IT infrastructure operations. Presentation today is knowledge-centered support from IT to the business. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Uh, follow-up session right after the keynote, so uh, uh, I hope I can keep your energy going and you know, not put you to sleep. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, is uh, KCS, or Knowledge Center Support, and how we use that not only in the IT environment in the University of Phoenix and also the Paul Group, but uh, how we are using it to leverage knowledge practices throughout the organization. So just very quickly, uh, the agenda that we'll go through today uh, we'll talk a little bit, I'll, I'll introduce you to the Apollo Education Group, uh, just to give you a little context around what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, we'll talk about knowledge management in general and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the problems that we see or the, uh, the issues that we have in adoption of knowledge practices, yet how important it is. We'll talk a little bit about how we started in IT and then broke out and uh, went to other areas of the business to use an IT-centric, uh, IT-like uh, knowledge management practice out in other organizations, such as student services and HR and other areas. Uh, we'll talk about crowd swarming. That's becoming a very hot topic. Uh, social media has uh, taught us the value of getting together and uh, having um, uh, places where we can go and, and uh, not only read things or talk about our experiences, but also to solve problems. That's becoming a de facto way to work in IT and other areas. Uh, the challenges we faced and how we measure success. So first, just a quick blurb about the Apollo Education Group. So I work for the Apollo Education Group. Uh, probably most folks know the largest subsidiary, University of Phoenix. Uh, however, uh, Apollo Education has a number of <coughs> other subsidiaries throughout the world. We have universities in uh, London. Uh, we have a university in uh, India, uh, South Africa, uh, Chile, Mexico and, and other places. Uh, so my team and I, we do uh, knowledge management not only for the University of Phoenix, but we also help enable the other subsidiaries as well. So now to the uh, meat of the conversation, problem statement around knowledge management in general. Knowledge is a key asset for the organization. There's a lot of information out there about uh, how much value is lost every time an employee leaves a company. Uh, and uh, takes that tacit or that, that learned knowledge with them. Uh, in fact, we've seen figures as much as $100,000 every time someone walks out the door of a, of a company. Uh, so we know it's a key asset. Uh, <clears throat> we also know that without the ability to share knowledge, that it has little value. Knowledge in my head won't help you at all. Uh, knowledge in the uh, head of a developer in your organization or uh, the uh, chief information officer or whoever that is, uh, if it's just in their head, once again, it does not help you meet your business goals. The uh, Fortune 500 companies, according to a study done a little over 10 years ago, Fortune 500 companies lose about $31 billion in knowledge assets every year due to the lack of knowledge and their inability to share knowledge in their culture. And then disparate knowledge or repositories, if you will, create a lot of problems. I don't know about you guys and where you work, but uh, you probably don't have one source of truth. You probably don't have a single information uh, system where you go, and that has the answer to everything. You should. It'd be nice, but it's just not the way we live. So given that, that knowledge is a key asset, what is the best way to, to ensure that you're using knowledge <coughs> as a way to do business that becomes part of your culture. Uh, the way that the University of Phoenix and the Apollo Education Group has gone down is called knowledge-centered support. We didn't invent this. It is actually the intellectual property for a think tank group called Consortium for Service Innovation. 
And uh, first of all, a quick uh, show of hands. Who in here is familiar with uh, Knowledge Center support of KCS? Okay, so uh, a couple folks are. So we'll talk a little bit more about the <coughs> principles around it. But uh, in the short time I have today, I won't be able to really train you guys in KCS or, or teach you how to do a KCS implementation if you want to go down a path in the organization. But you can find out how to do that for free. Just look up the Consortium for Service Innovation, and they have uh, documents, that, freeware we'll call it, online for anyone who wants to download them, uh, the, the KCS principles, uh, practices guide, how to measure, uh, measure your environment for success. Uh, it's, it's really a great, uh, a great place to go to, to find out about this particular methodology. And you'll hear a little bit more about them in just a minute. So I'll start with the problem statement again about knowledge management. Uh, this comes from the consortium as far as reasons that knowledge practices fail. Uh, typically related to what we'll call an ivory tower approach where you have a group or you have certain people that are anointed as the people who write the knowledge articles uh, and uh, they live in an ivory tower. Uh, they write what you think your frontline staff is gonna need to be able to serve a customer and then uh, 90% of it goes unused, which is a lousy investment, and what does get out there typically isn't well used because it's not written in the context of the person who's actually serving the customer. So there's a number of issues here, uh, reluctance to use the knowledge base, quality of content, searchability, and so on. Uh, you get down towards the bottom, it talks about technology and other. Uh, there's a theme here, and the theme here is really about process over tool, tool selection, and so on. So I know uh, everyone in here is, uh, is IT-oriented, otherwise you would be at this conference. So probably the first thing that's going through your mind when we talk about knowledge management is, well, what is the tool? What do I need to be able to, to use this? Uh, how can I enable this in my, my environment? So I actually have the tool for you. you know, we're not supposed to talk about technology, but I will for just a second. Here it is, folks called a unicorn. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It is uh, a myth, and it lives in a rainbow, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it's just not out there. Uh, some tools are better than others, but the reality is, you're, you're, if there's a key takeaway for you today, it is about get your process in place. Define your process, live by your process, whatever that may be. I'm going to talk about knowledge center support, but that is what will make you successful. Uh, as soon as you start relying on the tool to make you successful, you'll fail. I'm going to uh, introduce knowledge center support through a video, actually. It runs about eight minutes long. Uh, it's going to have a lot of jargon related to where I work, uh, because what this really was created for is uh, one of my team members, and by the way, the, the, the quality is not the greatest thing. This is a grassroots effort done on uh, like a $100 uh, camera. But uh, what it does is it introduces to our executive staff uh, the path that we are taking. And, uh, and like I said, there's a lot of jargon in there, but uh, it, it will at least give you kind of an overview of how KCS works and a little bit about uh, how we're addressing this problem statement. It'll take just a moment to load here. During recent years, University of Phoenix has begun implementing Future Strategy, a critical initiative to consolidate student data into a single system to improve both operations and student experience. In a similar manner, another initiative began to consolidate all of our knowledge repositories into a single source to improve the student experience, reduce misadvisement, and improve overall consistency. Our journey began in the Technical Assistance Center back in 2011. We've been using a proactive knowledge engineering approach for years, resulting in a plethora of revolving challenges in keeping content up to date and relevant in the ever-changing world of technology. We knew there must be a better way. In our research, we discovered the most cutting-edge way to manage knowledge, a methodology known as Knowledge Centered Support, or KCS. 
KCS has been in development in recent years by a nonprofit alliance known as the Consortium for Service Innovation. Over $50 million has been invested in its development, and it has seen a collective savings of over $2 billion. Here are some high profile organizations that utilize KCS today. Note Deutsche Bank, Express Scripts, and Pitney Bowes. All of these organizations have implemented KCS across their business with success, even in highly regulated environments such as our own. So what is KCS? KCS is a knowledge management methodology that focuses on knowledge as a key asset of the organization. The American Productivity and Quality Center once researched and quantified that whenever an employee retires from an organization, they leave with an estimated $500,000 worth of knowledge. Today, most organizations have no way of capturing that knowledge, equating to great financial loss with each departed employee. KCS provides the solution. KCS provides a means to capture knowledge when we become aware of it, structure that knowledge for added consistency, enabling people to reuse that knowledge whenever they need it. Each reuse of that knowledge warrants an opportunity to improve upon that knowledge. Let's take a look at an example of how this could work within your organization. First, a customer approaches an employee with a question. The employee searches the knowledge base, and if that knowledge is found, it's provided back to the customer. Now, if knowledge is not found, the question is captured. The employee finds an answer to the customer's question through other resources, and that knowledge is placed into an article and into the knowledge base in a draft form for other employees to utilize instantly. Once it has been used and shown value to the organization, a licensed employee reviews the content, validates its accuracy, and styles it for added consistency. Later, another licensed employee reviews the content and its applicability to self-service. Also, certain topics require subject matter experts, such as ethics and compliance, to review the knowledge as well. The real benefit of capturing knowledge in real time is that the return on investment is substantially greater. The turnaround time of creating new knowledge when needed through knowledge engineering is much longer than through KCS. The result of this latency is far less use and far more instances where employees are unable to answer the customer's questions in a timely manner, as is demonstrated here in this bell curve. Conversely, utilizing KCS, the knowledge is captured in real time during the first instance of a question. The answer to that question is then shared to other employees long before reaching the peak in volume of that specific question. This results in far greater return on investment per knowledge article. Because through KCS knowledge is generated from employees, anyone can be a hero. In fact, in TAC, this concept of becoming a hero led to the creation of our greatest KCS advocates, Captain KB and Data Girl. The TAC has seen excellent success since implementing KCS. A pertinent example of the benefit that KCS brought to the Technical Assistance Center occurred when a new version of Internet Explorer was released that was not compatible with eCampus. An agent identified a workaround and promptly updated the KCS knowledge article, which was quickly leveraged by their peers. Due to the high volume, this article was placed on the student login page of eCampus. During the first month, that article was hit by students over 140,000 times. The next month saw nearly 100,000 additional hits. If every hit to that article deflected a call, the savings over the course of the year would be over $3.3 million. The Qualifying Center and Customer Service Centers soon followed behind TAC in implementing KCS after seeing its incredible value. This initiative also identified some excellent talent that was not being previously leveraged. They have also experienced success through strong adoption and consistent knowledge evolution. This proven value of KCS within the AECCSS led to an assessment of many other areas of the business. By shadowing each department, utilizing focus groups, and surveying different employees, we identified that the rest of the organization also had serious knowledge challenges. Each department had one, if not more, of their own knowledge resources, many of which overlapped and were out of sync. Even worse, most didn't have an effective process for updating knowledge that was either out of date or requiring new knowledge. For example, we have the dot, the doc, the PMP, the mini dot, the financial aid reference web, SharePoint, the eCampus portal, help pets, email and personal storage, and the list goes on. Even more astounding, many of our systems had a turnaround time averaging between two weeks and a month. That's 30 days of potential misadvisement, inconsistent answers, and even potential compliance concerns. For example, at the time that we filmed this video, 
the degree overview tool still showed three PhD programs without any indication that they're being discontinued. Even phoenix.edu shows classes that have not been offered since 2010. Yes, that is the program we do offer. No, it's not. <laughs> Following this assessment, we are quickly engaged to begin working with the grad teams in conjunction with the Salesforce rollout. Utilizing grad team employees, over 2,000 articles were harvested from various employee resources prior to Salesforce launch in October of 2013. Since then, we've seen excellent adoption of the knowledge base and phenomenal feedback as to its utility. In fact, many users surveyed on SRM mentioned it in either their number one or number two favorite features of the Salesforce platform as a whole. Just listen to some of the things the advisors had to say about it. Um, the great thing about the knowledge base is that it helps you to collaborate with other people in a dynamic setting. So you're not just limited to the knowledge that you have. You can reach out to other people and through articles that they've written or through the question section, you can find out information that maybe you don't have. It's definitely made it more efficient. Um, and the information is more consistent because I don't have to rely on somebody else to provide me with the accurate information. So it's there and that can be better. So you have your one person, they're a light in the darkness on whatever it is that they're really good at. Well, creating an article means that now you can take your light and slide someone else's candle. And now you have a light that's spreading. And it just gets brighter and brighter from that point on. I definitely feel like I can help more uh, people within the organization. Um, just because the, inf the articles that I write, information I provide, can be accessed not only by finance advisors at work, next to, but also like our enrollment teams, our academic team. The adoption data speaks for itself. Knowledge articles were viewed nearly 11,000 times during the first five months since rollout. Also, during that time period, over 400 new articles have been created as a result of the demand for information from advisors. The success of this program really speaks for itself. In conclusion, we have two critical objectives ahead of us. The first is to utilize knowledge-centered support practices as the process for managing our knowledge across the enterprise. The second is to centralize all of our knowledge into a single source of truth. Please join with us in revolutionizing our organization by promoting a knowledge-sharing culture through knowledge-centered support practices. All right, that was Ryan, and uh, he is much a much better presenter than I am. Uh, so uh, uh, sorry for a lot, like I said, the jargon and talked about some tools and so on. But really, this was designed uh, for us to to ensure that our executive management understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, since most of you are new to KCS or the philosophy, I'll take you back through very quickly here the process. So in a standard environment. Uh, if you're using a knowledge base at all, whether it's someone in your service center or whoever that may be uh, uh, within IT that's uh, answering questions or solving problems, uh, handling incidents, uh, typically you get a contact, uh, you would look for knowledge, hopefully in the knowledge base, and then if that knowledge is found, you fix the issue or return the uh, request back to the customer. Where it becomes uh, part of our process or where it becomes iffy is what happens when the knowledge is not found. Customer has an issue, asks a question, the employee looks into the knowledge base and uh, doesn't find anything, so what happens at that point? Well, typically it's either escalated to a next level of support uh, or the customer is told, I'll have to call you back, I need to do some research, whatever that may be. Uh, multiply that by hundreds if not thousands of times if the knowledge isn't available and you have a large organization that's looking for knowledge at the same time, for instance, during a high priority incident. Well, in this case, someone figures it out, whether they escalate it and the answer comes back down from the next level of support, or whether it's they ask their manager, or they go out to Microsoft.com and find a workaround, whatever that is. The employee who's actually handling that uh, issue then enters that knowledge into the knowledge base. It's what we call a draft becomes uh, an article that's available to anyone in the organization uh, and it's not trusted yet. It's a draft, but it's something that can be used to solve the problem.
problem, an incidental problem, whatever that is. Uh, then when we talk about approvers here, we're talking about the licensed model of KCS. KCS has these things we call a KCS1, a 2, a 3, a coach, a KDE. We won't have time to get into that today, but what we're basically saying is these are not people who are managers or uh, upstream subject matter experts. These are employees who are doing the job every day, frontline staff, if we're talking about an IT service desk, it is that level one agent who is licensed through a combination of, of showing the right uh, skill set, the right judgment, if you will. Uh, they write the article as soon as they have found the answer and it becomes available. Then that approver, what we call KCS2, is someone who upstream sees, ah, you know what, this article has been used. There's value in this article. We've had X amount of hits and citations, if you will. Uh, I'm going to take a look at it and make sure that it's styled appropriately. I'm going to test it to make sure it really is indeed the appropriate way to do it. Like you could write a knowledge article that the, someone needs to remove their computer just to unplug it from the wall and plug it back in. It actually works. It's not a, really a best practice. So uh, they would look at that. They would uh, go upstream to the subject matter experts if necessary, like the developers. Uh, in the business world, it might be a dean, whoever that is. Uh, and say, yep, this is it. Now it is trusted knowledge. We know that this is good uh, to use anytime, anywhere. Then what we call level three or KCS3, we'll look at that knowledge based on citation. You know, we, only, we only work with knowledge articles uh, that show value through being used. Uh, we don't waste our time on thousands of articles that someone wrote that, that uh, may never ever be used or pulled up. The ones that are used, we know if we're getting a lot of hits against that, this probably should face the customer in our case, the student. Let's solve the problem for them without them having to contact us. So that person then makes sure that it's palatable for external view, whoever that customer or stakeholder may be. In our world, it's, it's uh, students or faculty. In your world, it could be uh, someone, uh, uh, an external customer. It could be someone, uh, if you're internal support, uh, who's a staff member in your organization. You get it out into the external facing knowledge base uh, for self-service. And that's where the real value of KCS comes. Uh, when you've got a very uh, robust self-service knowledge base, you can deflect a lot of calls or a lot of contacts. And it also provides an excellent customer experience because people can solve their own issue without having to try to get in to your service desk or whatever method they use to contact you. Now, we have added something you don't usually see in IT, and that is a compliance loop. Because a lot of our articles uh, for instance, if we're talking about can I enroll student X into program Y in state Z, someone needs to have eyes on that to make sure that that's uh, you know, an appropriate knowledge article. So uh, we will run that type of material uh, through some gatekeepers higher above us. So how do we do it? And this is the number one question we get a lot when we, when we present. And once again, go to the consortium. Uh, I also suggest Look into training, if this is a path you want to go down. Uh, there's some great uh, training that's provided by the Help Desk Institute, as well as uh, the consortium itself. Uh, there is a, a three-day certification course on the principles and how to, uh, to implement the program uh, that's, that's out there. And uh, we have, I believe, 40 people that have been through that certification course uh, so far. We're doing another class uh, at the end of this, or the end of next month. We're running another 15 people through it um, to, to make sure they really understand the value benefits and the methodology itself. So uh, we, that, that's very important. So one of the things as we move down the business environment, so from an IT perspective, the, uh, uh, the KCS principles didn't always fit, or at least the business didn't think that it would. A lot of concern about what we're going to have frontline staff writing articles. Are you kidding me? Well. No, they're the ones who actually do the job every day. They probably need, they probably know better than anybody what uh, knowledge is needed, and there's a process in place to make sure that we just don't put junk out there. So we went down that path. Um, we had to be flexible as we moved into the business environment. Like I said, uh, I mentioned earlier, adding the compliance loop and so on, because the business is a little bit different. But we never lost our KCS soul, and that soul is, that your front line or the people that are doing the job are the actual stewards of the knowledge. Knowledge domain experts are, are essential. Uh, since you guys, by and large, aren't familiar with the principles, 
basically a, a KDE or knowledge domain expert is someone who still does the job. You know, it's not an ivory tower person, but someone who's very closely linked to uh, the folks that are doing the job every day. And uh, uh, but they take anywhere from 80% of their time to 20% of their time, depending on the environment, uh, making sure that the health of the knowledge base is, uh, or that the knowledge base is healthy. These are the folks that help look at the hit counts uh, and make sure that the ones, twos, and threes are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, they also look at archiving and so on to keep the knowledge base healthy. So they're ones that say, this knowledge article has never been hit. Is it just junk? Uh, or does it not have the right metadata to bring it up in a search? Uh, or are there other reasons? Uh, is it seasonal? And we can archive it for now, but we'll bring it back in tax season or whatever that may be. And as you go through your program, you're going to want to proactively create artifacts. And what an artifact is from a project management perspective is um, elements that make the program successful. You know, you started out, uh, you go through a project to get this kicked off in your environment. Uh, you do all kinds of discovery, and you come up with things like your style guide, like how you need to write these knowledge articles. Uh, you make sure that they're, they're created uh, and that they, they continue to live and don't get lost as the project moves forward. So I'll go through this quickly. Uh, let me get a quick time check. How much time do you have? Um, you've got 15, um, 15 minutes. Okay, great. So I'll just run through this very quickly. Like I say, I get a lot of questions. Well, exactly how do you do this? Once again, go to the consortium website. You get a lot of information. But down and dirty, these are the four main areas that are very important in the KCS project when you're kicking off and you're starting out. First is the communications piece. The strategic framework is developing the why am I doing this statement. Uh, in other words, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve reduction and escalation? Are you trying to achieve reduction in support cost? Are you trying to achieve uh, a better customer experience because they have uh, access to uh, a better self-service knowledge base that you've created through this process? Uh, what is that? Uh, you put that together because that will drive your project. By understanding what you want to achieve, you'll understand exactly what needs to be in the program and what does not need to be in the, the program. Communication and branding plan. This is a change in how people work. We're going to ask the front line to actually become stewards of knowledge. That takes time. Uh, if folks are married to an ACD, which most folks are in a service desk environment, there's going to be some time that they need, some ox time, if you will, to be able to write knowledge articles. That has to be understood. Uh, and so that has to be communicated at all levels, exactly what we're trying to achieve and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then what's in it for me? That is a statement, an elevator pitch, if you will, uh, that you get at every level. What's in it for me? For the executive, it's, I'm going to improve my customer uh, satisfaction scores, and uh, I'm going to reduce the cost of support, or I'm going to keep the same cost, but be able to work on other things in that environment and take it to the next level, uh, and be able to report to Wall Street, we're doing a wonderful thing. And then down to the level of the folks at the front line, uh, you'll have a lot of, oh my gosh, if you pull everything out of my head, uh, why do you even need me? Uh, what you have to do is be able to think about what's in it for them. And really, what that comes down to is you become uh, an important part of a solution, a knowledge solution, a knowledge sharer in your environment, uh, as opposed to uh, part of the problem, a knowledge hoarder. Content management. The content is king in this process. How, you, uh, uh, how it comes up, how it's read, needs to be standardized. So your style guide will tell you exactly what a knowledge article should look like. Uh, as you get started, you have to figure out how we're going to start with content. The consortium typically suggests that regardless of the size of your current knowledge base, if it's a failure, start from scratch. Just start with something empty and then add knowledge articles as you go. Uh, most people are reluctant to do that, and we certainly were, uh, particularly with a lot of articles like how do you reset a password that have compliance concerns. So we, we did a uh, import, of a, we did a scrub and an import, uh, but it depends on your environment. And then the maintenance workflow, exactly what constitutes an article that needs to be archived, what constitutes an article that needs to be updated. That's handled through the KCS process itself, but uh, all these things have to be understood and, and become part of your standard operating procedure. Rewards and recognition, this is very key. You're going to introduce a new way into work, of working, 
uh, to your front line and the new way of thinking to your managers all the way up to the C-level staff. Uh, the only way that we can do that well is to make sure that the program is adopted and you do that through awards. And we're not talking about monetary awards, although that's always helpful. We're talking about uh, recognizing those people that become contributors to the program. Uh, integration with existing programs. In our environment, we have an overarching recognition program called uh, uh, Success Factors and uh, an EPIC, where people go and, and uh, tell each other we've done a good job. And it's really a fantastic program. So what we did was we worked with that overarching university-wide program and said, hey, how can we get points that we can award um, for the appropriate behaviors in the knowledge management space? So now our uh, knowledge management program is part of the overall EPIC program. So we integrated with that group as opposed to having a standalone deal that, that, uh, that has to be funded individually, that has to be uh, maintained uh, on an individual basis. And that helps adoption because it's visible to everybody. And then reporting. You'll see it a little later, and I'll go through it quickly, but get the right reporting. If you're not able to tell someone what you did, well, in fact, I'll give a statement an old boss of mine once said, the key to, credit, to integrity is tell someone what you're going to do, do it, then prove you did it. Reporting is to prove you did it. You won't know that your folks are using the knowledge base unless you can say, this agent goes to the knowledge base X amount of times and this one never goes. I need to coach that person or find out what's missing and why they won't go. Um, all the way from that up to the, uh, at, up to the uh, uh, top level, being able to show call deflection and self-service uh, uh, self uh, wins to executive management. And then finally, training. Uh, we not only train staff face-to-face, -face, we created enterprise-level uh, computer-based trainings for everyone in the company on the value of the knowledge pro program and how to participate. Access to systems, that just really uh, speaks to something, well, I'll have to go through it quickly, but uh, if you're like we are, you've got a lot of different systems, you have to make sure that whoever is linking to a separate system from your knowledge base for approved knowledge, uh, that that system you can get into. And then assessment to fill KCS roles. That really comes down to you've got to have the right people doing this, and uh, you've got to figure out what motivates them, and you have to figure out who has the right judgment to be able to participate. Nice to have. So this is for a very large enterprise. Uh, it's not. First of all, it's great to have your executive certified in the process. In fact, this upcoming uh, training that we're doing, we're going to have uh, associate deans as well as VPs in it, so that they understand what we're trying to achieve, and they actually can recite the process themselves. Uh, Project and program manager, that's important uh, if, if you have a small IT service desk. That's probably a role that's handled by one person who is also online staff or whatever that may be. Uh, the bigger the program, the better it is to have someone who coordinates activities on your behalf. Crowdstorming, uh, this has become a very important part of our process. Crowdstorming is simply a way of saying, what we're going to do is enable community or a place where people who don't find the knowledge they're looking for can ask the question. Anybody can answer that. And then, depending on the environment, either uh, proctor or through votes or whatever that may be, the, the answer is discovered. And then someone ports that information into the knowledge base where, the, uh, where, uh, where it becomes part of that source of truth, if you will, where it goes through the process and people will look at it, make sure that it's appropriate based on headcount. So I throw the name of technology up there, not to talk about it, just because I know the IT folks in the room will look at that and say, wow, that's four in your knowledge base, you have more than that. I bet these don't talk together very well. You're absolutely right, they don't. Then on top of that, three of the four really aren't KCS enabled, so we've had to create our own processes around this. So as you go down a project path, figure out what you need to do to make a tool support your process. Lack of reporting was a big issue for us. Oops. Sorry, folks. I think I ran out of battery. 
on this. And I know I'm about out of time. So, very quickly, this is an example of how many sources of truth we have in our environment. Um, what we're attempting to do is consolidate them into one. Now, is that something that we can do? It's probably the unicorn. The reality is that there's different requirements for different departments. Uh, the way that we've approached it is, for those sources of truth that need to be standalone, we simply link to them. So there's a knowledge article that we gave you context around what you need to say and how you need to say it, or what the problem is. But if you need to go outside the four walls, or you need to move into, uh, or you need to go to a trusted source, like an our world policy and procedure guide, uh, which tells you exactly the, the rules from a department education standard perspective, what you, you should do in certain situations, uh, we simply link to that. So the knowledge base will bring it up, so you're working on the same console or a single console, but then it'll link and take you to the appropriate place. So our successes, we have, uh, we have almost 3,000 people that are doing KCS in our environment, either consumers of knowledge who can comment on it or people who are um, licensed to uh, actually participate. We have 900 licensed folks, those one, two, threes, coaches, or KDEs. We also are about to roll out to another 2,700 over the next fiscal year. And we have something called a KCS Council. So we have all these different departments that are very different than IT that are doing this process. Um, we have a council meeting where we get all these folks together and we make sure that uh, not only leadership but also the KDEs uh, participate and uh, we can talk about our challenges, we can talk about our best practices, and we just make sure that we're all aligned in a single process despite the difference in the business deliverable. We created the you know, training, and then these are the things that you'll probably want to speak to as far as what equals success reduction in training time, improved time to proficiency, reduced escalation. Improve speed to knowledge, reduction of misadvisement, very important in our environment, and improve quality and quantity of self-service content, and then increase to employee morale. I know I'm out of time here, so I'll just run through this. So just very quickly, data that we saw in our environment. Sorry guys, since I can't click, I have to get really close to see here. Our self-service portal uh, sees anywhere from 800,000 to 1.5 million individual unique hits from students every year. It resolves issues for them. Um, if every one of those folks had to try to call our IT service desk, we would never be able to serve them. We'd never be able to handle the volume. We saw a 91% decrease in inbound call volume to our ethics and compliance department once we got an external for staff facing knowledge base using the KCS process developed for them. So they no longer take calls all day. They work on actual work, and most people get what they need just by going to the, to the self service knowledge base. We did the same in human resources. They've had 20,000 visitors in just the first five months of operation. And we've decreased training time in the majority of the areas by 15% or more. Why? Because most of the training now is the 10,000 foot level. Uh, with the caveat, well, but to actually figure out how to use the tool or how to answer this question, go to the knowledge base. And as mentioned in the video, number one and number two uh, in our uh, customer relation management tool roll out to roughly 3,000 people at this point. The number one and number two best liked piece of it was the knowledge base. And then this you already saw, which is basically just the power of an article. In this particular case, with the Internet Explorer issue, we had over 250,000 unique hits against that particular article. And it's over a year old now, so it's not recent stats. Uh, if those folks were able to call in at an industry standard of about $13 per call, it would have been $3 million in service. The reality is that those customers would have never got to us, because if they called, they would have been in a two-hour queue. Folks, sorry that I had to run through so quickly. Uh, ran out of time there. Uh, do I have any time for questions at all? Uh, maybe one or, one, one or two questions. All right, great. Uh, any questions? Hey, Steve. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if you review any of the success to keep this article relevant, 
the oh, okay uh, to keep our articles relevant. What we use in the KCS process is first we only pay attention to the articles that are being used for the most part. Uh, in other words, there's an article and it's been hit ten times in one of our environments. That's when we start running it through the process where someone looks at it and says, okay, this has had value, people are looking at it, let's make sure it's right. Uh, the other piece of that is what the knowledge domain expert does, which is they'll run reports around uh, what articles are out there, what articles aren't being hit. Uh, so why aren't they being hit? Uh, do we just need to archive them? Do we need to spend any time on them? Or is there something that actually is, is uh, you know, it could be critical and it's just getting lost. Uh, it doesn't have the right metadata or whatever that 